recording this. Well, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending upon where you're located, everybody. And I want to tell you that today we have the pleasure of Dr. Juan Carlos Cisneros from Mexico City. Um, he is uh, currently at the uh, National Institute of Rehabilitation um, and uh, it's a division of the otolaryngology head and neck department um, of the National Institute in Mexico City. Um, he's a neurotologist. He, we're quite lucky that his native tongue is Spanish, but he speaks excellent English, so you shouldn't have any trouble um, understanding him today. Um, and uh, this lecture was given in um, Spanish to our Spanish group uh, over a month ago, very well received. And um, I think that you'll find this lecture to be uh, an eye opener for a lot of you. Uh, he makes a difficult subject easy. So with little more to say, um, Juan, thank you very much for joining us. And um, please go ahead and um, we're, lo we're looking forward to your lecture. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Wagner. It's, it's a pleasure to be with all of you guys. And uh, I hope um, to let something with, with you. Uh, I'm gonna talk about the a historical perspective uh, of the civilar surgery, um, where we were uh, at the beginning of the 20th century, where we are now, and um, what's coming next, uh, next for us. So, um, I'm gonna try to be brief, um, but I always um, like to talk about history. When I, when I, when I um, started something, um, so um, I'll begin with this. When, when, when studying about the, the evolution of, of modern day neurotology, um, I always find myself amazed uh, with the developments that occurred uh, at the beginning of the 20th century. And as early as 1898, uh, Dr. Feather Krauss, uh, he, he's considered the father of German neurosurgery. He performed the first basivilocochlear nerve section uh, to treat a patient with severe uh, tinnitus. So uh, from then, we have in 1904, Charles Harrison Fraser. Uh, he had trained in Germany um, with Dr. Krauss for instance, and later he became one of the biggest influences in the development of early neurosurgery in America. Uh, he took this idea and, and, and carried out the first posterior fossa vestibulococcular nerve section to treat vertigo uh, in a patient with Meniere's disease. In 1925, um, Walter Edward Dandy, uh, an American neurosurgeon who is considered one of the founding fathers of neurosurgery. He popularized this technique with good results. Uh, but I, I believe the game changer came in 1931 when uh, Dr. Kenneth McKenzie uh, performed the first selective vestibular erection. Um, he divided the vestibular nerve, preserving the cochlear nerve. And um, a year after this development, even Dr. Dandy who had already performed around 300 cochlear vestibular nerve sections, began to perform uh, vestibular nerectomy with cochlear nerve sparing. Uh, so Dr. Dandy reported 607 uh, vestibular nerectomies uh, with cochlear nerve preservation before his death, uh, 60 years old in 1946. And he achieved this, a vertical control of 90% and a mortality rate less than 1%. And uh, as a mouth opener, he did all of this without using a surgical microscope because a surgical microscope can, came after. So um, I always think this is not impressive, a, a lot more, I don't know the word for that, but it's, it's, it's outstanding. Um, competing with this selective vestibular nerve sections uh, for the treatment of vertigo in the early 20th century, uh, there were many different labyrinthectomy techniques, which originated in 1904 uh, with three English otologists, uh, Lakin Jenkins from London and, and uh, Milligan, who was from Manchester. And um, 
Not many years later, uh, a third option appeared, which was the endolymphatic sac decompression um, developed or proposed by uh, Dr. Josh Borman uh, from Bordeaux uh, in 1927. And uh, the popularity of, of all these less invasive extradural procedures, uh, it resulted in a significant reduction in the number of vestibular uh, nerve sections, um, which um, were performed later on, right? So it is interesting, I think, that almost a hundred years have passed since these techniques were first described by those incredibly gifted surgeons and uh, a verdict of which one is better, or at least better suited for the different clinical, clinical situations is, is yet a matter of, of, of controversy. So a uh, hundred years later, which surgical technique is better would be the, the, the best question to do. So um, in the second half of the, of the 20th century after 1950, uh, we have uh, a lot of development also. Uh, for instance, uh, in 1956, it was Dr. Har Harold Schudnicht uh, who performed the first intratympanic injections. Uh, this was really interesting and, and, and uh, really thought forward by, by many surgeons. And I believe that, for instance, currently, gentamicin intratympanic injections would be the preferred choice for many of the autologist treating Meniere's disease. Um, in 1961 uh, was also a game changer, I believe, because it was a time when William House performed the first microsurgical division of, of, of the vestibular nerve, but using a middle cranial fossa approach. This was, this was a, uh, an approach previously described, but he used it for, for, for this having great results. Also after this, he started using the same approach uh, to treat uh, vestibular schwannomas uh, of different sizes and uh, using a surgical microscope uh, in which he was part of the, of the, of the um, developing uh, surgeons. In 1967, uh, Cody reported the repetitive saculotomy technique placing a tack, the Cody tack in the state's footplate. Uh, physiopathologically, this was interesting, but most of his patients ended up with a profound sensory neural hearing loss. And in 1974, another surgical te technique was described by Dr. Richard Gasek, which was the first surgical solution um, for untreatable recurrent uh, BPPV, right? The singular neurectomy. Uh, we'll talk about this later on. And uh, we also have in 1980, Silverstein and Norrell, who performed their first vestibular neurectomy, selective vestibular neurectomy, but using a very autological approach, with it, which is the uh, retro labyrinth pre sigmoid uh, approach. Um, other things that, that came to pass uh, were in 1990, where Dr. Parnes and McClure. Uh, did the first posterior semicircular canal occlusion for untreatable BPPV, which rendered results uh, that were even better than those uh, by the singular neurectomy. And uh, probably the, the, the last thing that came to pass was in 1998 when Lloyd Minor described the superior semicircular canal basin syndrome and its surgical management. So where are we now? Uh, I'm going to talk about the last probably five or six or 10 years. Uh, what, what have we been doing in the last 10 years, maybe? I had the opportunity to work um, with International Archives of Otolaryngology as an editor uh, and to work with some very gifted uh, surgeons from Mexico and Brazil uh, to do these um, uh, this edition of, of International Archives of Otolaryngology uh, titled Surgical uh, Treatment of Vertigo, a Historical Perspective. And uh, I, I suggest uh, that you read it as it's, it's awesome. It's from 2017, but I believe it's still really current. And I'm gonna talk about uh, some of what's 
um, been developed since. So talking about Meniere's disease, first of all, uh, we know that Meniere's disease uh, should be treated um, with, in an orderly fashion. We first start with diet, salt restriction, diuretics, uh, then we might consider, for instance, for instance, beta easting in in large in in, in high doses, uh, intratympanic steroid injections, uh, which are, uh, are the first invasive treatments we're going to talk about. Uh, then we could talk about endolymphatic sac surgery or intratympanic gentamicin when steroid injections are not useful. Um, ventilation tubes have been described by by some. Um, considering they may lower the pressure in the middle ear and this may help with um, patients with high drops. Uh, I really don't have experience placing ventilation tubes in patients with Meniere's. And then uh, come more invasive procedures such as labyrinthectomy um, with cochlear sparing and cochlear nerve, nerve sparing. So we can consider a cochlear implant afterwards and selective vestibular and erectomy. Something that I uh, uh, would suggest is for you to consider treatment for migraine in many of these patients that aren't responding well for uh, diuretics, diets, salt restriction, and beta easting, and sometimes steroids, because sometimes when you use uh, migraine treatment, everything get, gets uh, better in a large amount of patients before going to those invasive, invasive procedures. Why do I place endolymphatic sac surgery before intratympanic gentamicin? Because I believe in, in, in endolymphatic sac surgery as a surgery that preserves hearing a lot better than intratympanic gentamicin. Even though endolymphatic sac surgery is a lot more invasive, it's a real surgical procedure under general anesthesia, and intratympanic gentamicin can be done uh, in the office. Something interesting is um, those works uh, that, 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 that were done by Dr. Thompson, for instance, uh, in uh, 1989 and 1998, disregarding um, sac decompression and sac surgery and the lymphatic sac surgery. But um, later on, because um, they said that there were no differences between cortical mastoidectomy and the lymphatic sac surgery. But later on, this was uh, proved wrong um, by Dr. Nagaraja and Dr. Welling in uh, this article in the 2000, um, re-evaluating the efficacy of mastoid shunt surgeries and uh, endolymphatic sac surgery. Because um, these articles from 1989 made, it, made everyone uh, then um, stop performing endolymphatic sac surgery which I believe is uh, a surgical uh, procedure with um, really good results. And you'll see that in the, in the next article. I had a chance to, to do this article in 2017 um, where we evaluated more than 90 patients with uh, Meniere's disease. And uh, here, what I'm showing is um, a surgical procedure in which um, I'm operating on a left side, uh, ear and mastoidectomy. Uh, this is a posterior semicircular canal. Uh, here, we, here we have the facial nerve, here we have the sigmoid simus, and uh, the dura from the posterior cranial fossa exposed, where we are going to localize uh, or identify the uh, endolymphatic sac. So uh, this is the way in which um, we open the, the, the endolymphatic sac. Uh, remember that the endolymphatic sac is um, a meningeal um, covering. Um, so you can open it. Uh, if you open it properly, you won't have um, um, a fistula or um, a CSF leak. Or, okay, so you can open it properly and then you can, or you may, I mean, or you may not place a shunt, uh, there's no real benefit um, according to current literature about placing a shunt as it was described by Dr. Paparella a lot, a lot of years ago. Um, what is described currently, for instance, is 
uh, is um, injection with steroids, for instance, uh, directly in the in the lymphatic duct and and the sac, and that might work. Okay, so um, here I show you the results of uh, this paper from 2017. Um, in which I had the chance to, to participate with Dr. Ricardo Bento from Brazil. And um, here I show you the number of unilateral and bilateral patients and their functional class. Um, and uh, what was really interesting is that we saw not only an important control of vertigo this, uh, uh, in more than 90% of the patients, wow. But the 40% of oh, the unilateral disease patients improved their hearing, and 28% of the bilateral disease patients uh, who had surgery on both ears improved their hearing also. Um, and with hearing preservation, in 88%. So I do believe in, in the lymphatic sac surgery, and I will show you a, a, a case of a 44 year old woman who had eight months with daily vertigo spells lasting for about two hours, uh, residual dizziness about two, uh, about, uh, after these spells um, with nausea and masses. Uh, she had a left-sided tinnitus with intensity as high as 10 of 10, 10 out of 10, which improved to seven out of 10 when everything was okay. Um, between spells, between vertigo spells. Imagine daily vertigo spells of two hours. Um, her quality of life was terrible. Uh, she had le left-sided progressive hearing loss with diminished pitch discrimination and not, no other associated signs or symptoms. Um, you can see here the, the, the physical exploration, which was most important was a Fukuda test, which was positive uh, with deviation to the right side and uh, no perception, uh, left-sided perception um, with fork tests. So uh, this was her audiometry and uh, noted discrimination, which achieves about 50% in 110 dBs. Uh, so it was really bad. Uh, this was in October, 2017. And uh, what, what I propose for this patient uh, this was a treatment uh, that the patient had at the time, beta uh, um 72 milligrams daily, um, diuretic, uh, hydroxycine, and uh, low sodium diet. And uh, we proposed um, uh, steroid and tretinpanic injections, but the patient uh, did not accept this. Uh, she wanted something... Uh, that was a bit more aggressive maybe because uh, she, she, she had a lot of, of, of dizziness, a lot of vertigo, uh, really bad quality of life. And she had tried intratympanic injections about a year uh, before with another surgeon. So uh, she did not accept this. And uh, what we did was a sactic compression technique, which I will show you. This is a left-sided mastoidectomy. The mastoidectomy has been carried on. Uh, you can see the uh, sigmoid sinus, uh, which I will uh, skeletonize a bit more. And there you can see the posterior fossa dura. Um, I'm working on, on getting as much space as I can. As you can see, she has a high riding jugular bulk. I've seen that most of the patients uh, that benefit from this surgical procedure are those that have an anatomical abnormality in the side with Meniere's. For instance, a high riding jugular ball. There you can see uh, uh, the endolymphatic duct and the place where the endolymphatic sac is going to be opened. Um, I'm opening the endolymphatic sac. So sometimes you may, may even uh, notice um, some fluid coming out of the endolymphatic sac. If you did it properly, this must be um, endolymph. It's not uh, a CSF leak uh, because of the volume. So uh, 
there you can open it a bit more. And as I told you before, I usually don't use Silastic anymore. Uh, I don't do shunts also. Um, what I do is uh, sometimes to place a, a steroid or uh, steroid embedded pledgets on top of the endolymphatic sac. And this has been working really good the last couple of years for me. So uh, this was the geometry before surgery. This is December, a couple of months after surgery, two months after surgery. Notice improvement also in speech discrimination. This is January 2000, 2018, uh, about six months after surgery. Um, this is 2020, a year after surgery. And notice that this patient uh, still has a really good uh, speech discrimination. She's now uh, really stable with this disease and she's currently using a hearing aid with really good results. And she hasn't had any vertigo spells in the last three years. So I do believe in endolymphatic sac decompression. Uh, this was the... Um, Posturography from these patients. Notice the improvement uh, she had in a couple of years. This was also accompanied by uh, vestibular rehabilitation. Not only the surgical procedure was successful, but vestibular rehabilitation was really useful. Uh, something that's interesting is these articles by Dr. Uh, Saliva, Alajrani also, um, that talk about endolymphatic duct blockage. What they use uh, are clips to literally block the endolymphatic duct. And uh, strangely, they have the same good results uh, reported with endolymphatic sac surgery. In endolymphatic sac decompression and in endolymphatic sac shunt surgery, we try to improve um, endolymphatic drainage. Uh, but what they do is completely the opposite. So I do believe that we do not know as much as we think we know about endolymphatic sac function or what we are doing with endolymphatic sac decompression. Um, something that's really interesting in the treatment of Meniere's disease uh, is simultaneous labyrinthectomy and cochlear implantation. Um, we have to do this simultaneously because if you perform a, a labyrinthectomy in a patient, uh, the cochlea will become ossified uh, in a really high percentage of patients in a really small period of time um, because of inflammation caused by the labyrinthectomy itself. Uh, so even if you spare the cochlear nerve by doing only a vestibular labyrinthectomy, you should do a cochlear implant in patients with Meniere's that have um, profound hearing loss in the same surgical procedure if this is what you're uh, looking up to because results are excellent as this uh, article suggests. Mm. Talking about another pathology, we're gonna talk about uh, superior semicircular canalization syndrome. And where's the dilemma? Uh, currently. This was also an, an article I published in 2017 uh, with another uh, excellent um, team of, of, of Mexican autologists, uh, Dr. Palma and Dr. Vega, uh, talking about superior semicircular canal diseases and our experience so far. Um, and th the dilemma was between doing uh, obliteration for the superior semicircular canal to get uh, good results or resurfacing techniques uh, to reconstruct the superior semicircular canal. And also, um, surgeons are also talking about doing this uh, through a transmastoid approach, opening the canal laterally and uh, blocking it, or going through a middle fossa approach where uh, uh, you can see that the essence um, in a proper way. So um, what have we learned about this? I will show you a second case. Uh, this is a 55 year old woman. She has fibromyalgia and depression. So this was not an easy case to work on. Uh, she had chronic unsteadiness and vertigo spells lasting seconds, but uh, throughout the whole day, uh, she had, uh, sometimes she talked about a hundred vertigo spells 
along the day, uh, especially related to um, um, loud noises and uh, pre pressure changes. Um, she had tinnitus of different types also uh, with an intensity of eight out of 10. And uh, she reported um, normal hearing bilaterally, um, even considering that tinnitus. As you can see in these scans, these coronal scans, we can see that the essence is bilateral. Uh, this is her posturography with a lot of the similar commitment. Um, this was her audiogram. As you can see, most patients uh, have uh, a small gap. Most patients with superior semicircular canal dates and syndrome have a small gap, uh, especially in low frequencies. She didn't, um, and she had normal hearing apparently. And uh, this is one of the partial uh, reconstructions. So you can see the, uh, the essence. Uh, these are the vestibular evoked myogenic um, um, the vamps of these patients, vestibular evoked myogenic potentials uh, uh, from these patients. You can see it's bilateral. You can see responses at 65 dBs and 60 dBs on the right side. Um, so we considered uh, to do the surgery on the worst side uh, first, considering the, uh, her symptoms, her tinnitus, and, um, and uh, also the pumps. And uh, this is the, 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 the type of incision I, I, I like to do currently. Uh, this is an incision I saw from uh, Dr. Daniel Lee in Boston, and I kind of liked it. I believe the last maybe uh, five or six patients uh, I've done surgery, uh, on for superior semicircular canal dacents. I've done this type of incision and it, it works really well. Um, and here I will sh show you the, the surgery. This is a craniac uh, craniectomy I, I, I perform. It's um, uh, two centimeter uh, for 1.5 centimeter, maybe a craniectomy. Not that, not that large a craniectomy, and I'm currently doing it a lot smaller. Uh, usually, I tend to do a, a, a small hole in the in the uh, meningeal covering to drain a lot, uh, some fluid and and, and uh, relax the temporal bone. Uh, after that, all of this is 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 done with the microscope, and um, after I have uh, proper access, there you can see also a. Um, um, uh, middle ear deesons um, in the attic. So uh, I tried to do this um, um, using the surgical microscope until I get to the superior semicircular canal, which you are looking at right now. And after that, I use an endoscope, which I love because you can see a lot better. You can have better control of your suction you can uh, see there the superior petrosal sinus also. And uh, this works really good if you are trying to occlude the superior semicircular canal as you're uh, looking at right now. Um, this gives really good results. I use bone wax for that. And after that, I place um, on top of everything, I place temporalis fascia. Um, also some bone, bone dust and, uh, or bone pathé. And uh, it really works well. Uh, I don't do resurfacing. I mainly um, do canal occlusion because uh, the first two cases with that resurfacing, they had good results at the beginning, but then they started having more symptoms. There you can see the malleus and incus because there was also that the essence which uh, we also repaired. And uh, this is a way uh, in which I fix the bone after, after doing a craniectomy with four nylon sutures, and it works really well. There you can see it. It's good to, 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 to replace the bone and, and to fix it. It, it, it helps a lot. Uh, 
during recovery. So this is the evolution of this patient, evolution after two years. Uh, she had important symptomatic improvement without complete resolution. This is because she had a bilateral lesions. Uh, her tinnitus improved uh, to three out of 10, but continues. And she has no more unsteadiness, which was really important for her. Um, uh, we gave psychological and psychiatric support for her and uh, pain management for fibromyalgia and her depression, uh, which was really important uh, part of the treatment. And she preserved her hearing in the operated ear. And uh, we considered not to operate on the second ear, uh, only to give her vestibular rehabilitation. Um, and well, uh, it was important to do this vestibular rehabilitation and to reassure the patient as to avoid a future persistent postural perception dizziness syndrome. So um, these are the BEMPs, uh, OVEMPs two years after surgery and the CVEMPs two years after surgery uh, in which you can see uh, the improvement in that uh, left side area. And uh, strangely, after two years, uh, this is her audiogram. You can see she had no loss of hearing in the operated ear, but now you can see that uh, gap uh, which appeared a couple of years after in the, audio, in the audiogram uh, um, in the low frequencies. Um, what are the advantages of using endoscopy, which is something currently being used by many surgeons? Uh, you can use a smaller surgical axis, a craniectomy, maybe uh, two for two, maybe even uh, a one centimeter for one centimeter craniectomy. Um, it's useful in cases where the superior petrosal sinus is responsible because uh, you can use a 30 degree endoscope and it will help you uh, navigate properly through the middle fossa with a smaller axis and to properly observe the area of the deesons. And uh, you will have better view of the deesons with better control of aspiration and the certainty of, of canal obliteration if that's the technique uh, you want to use. So look at this uh, endoscopic image where you, we can see uh, the superior semicircular canal open with the deesons, and you can see it occluded um, thanks to the use of the endoscope. Um, another discussion, as I told you, this is a case uh, where transmastered obliteration was performed. Uh, that's the, you can see the horizontal semicircular canal uh, here, the posterior semicircular canal, and the superior semicircular canal here. It's a left-sided mastoidectomy. Uh, here you can see the opening uh, blue line, uh, the blue lining of the superior semicircular canal. And after it's open, you can occlude it with bone wax. And uh, it works really well also. But I believe this um, has a higher rate of um, uh, sensory neural hearing loss than if you go through the middle fossa. These are the patients I've uh, done surgery uh, on. It's 17 patients with diagnosis of superior semicircular canal Dixon syndrome. Uh, as you can see, the ages, uh, if it was uh, bilateral, left-sided or right-sided, um, the symptoms which were present on, on the patients, chronic stability, hearing loss, hyperacusis, tinnitus, Hennebert sign, uh, Tulio phenomenon, which was really prevalent, and uh, how all of them had preoperative positive um, vestibular, vestibular evoked myo myogenic potentials. Uh, this is really important uh, for you guys to distinguish these disease, for instance, from otosclerosis or uh, other diseases that can mimic uh, superior semicircular deesens syndrome. And uh, notice that in most of them, um, in all of the, the, the patients that were uh, operated on, uh, VEMPs normalize or become negative. And uh, this NTs are the ones that were uh, not treated. So from the 17 patients, uh, I have five of them that um, didn't accept surgery. Uh, the audiograms, um, most of them preserved a normal uh, hearing. And something that is also really important is to look at the stepedial reflex in these patients that can also help you distinguish this from autosclerosis. 
so we had 66% per, of patients with Tulio phenomenon, 66% uh, percent of patients with chronic unsteadiness and instability, 33% of them had hyperacusis and, and tinnitus, 22% reported conductive hearing loss, and 11% symptoms related to pressure changes. From these 17 patients, 12 were operated, eight by middle fossa approach, four by transmastoid approach, five were unilateral with excellent results, uh, and six were bilateral. Um, and in all of our bilaterals, we only operated on one ear. Most of our patients improved, uh, to improve that much operating on one ear, the worst ear generally, uh, that they didn't want surgery on the second ear, not because uh, the surgical procedure was terrible or anything, it's because they really improved with the first surgery. So uh, we haven't had patients with surgery on both sides. Um, the surgical duration was two to four hours and the hospital stay about 48 hours. But it's important to notice that not all third window syndromes are neither lateral semicircular canal, round window or oval window fistulas, nor superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndromes. We have to recognize also um, patients with posterior semicircular canal dehiscence. There are lots of reports about this uh, coming from 2006, 2015, 2010, and it's now currently also um, third window pathology that's well recognized. Uh, as you can see it here, notice the posterior semicircular canal, which is open here to the posterior uh, cranial fossa. Notice in these patients how uh, he has a high riding jugular bulb and notice here the posterior semicircular canal, which uh, is in direct contact with a jugular bulb. Uh, notice this patient here with the posterior semicircular canal also open to the posterior fossa. And here also in a patient with a dominant high riding jugular bulb. So uh, always look for them. So what's the treatment for diverse causes of untractable vertigo? Uh, well, vestibular neurectomy, for instance, it's still used, rarely, but still used. It has a hearing preservation about of 90%, but you should consider that this is an initial uh, hearing preservation because many surgeons and many patients and many reports talk about loss of that hearing in the first six months to one year uh, after surgery. Um, it obviously has complications related to intradural surgery. 10% of patients may have um, CSF leak, and it has a success in vertigo control of 90%. Uh, you can do it by approaches such as middle fossa, retro labyrinth, pre-sigmoid or retrosigmoid. Surgical labyrinthectomy uh, obviously uh, is done for patients who have a profound hearing loss or at least severe hearing loss, because uh, it will uh, undoubtedly damage uh, uh, hearing. Uh, in this, hearing is extra dural with a success rate of 90%. Uh, if we combine both as a translabyrinth vestibular or vestibular cochlear neurectomy, we may get a vertigo success rate control of 96%. Uh, but we add to labyrinthectomy the complications of possible CSF leak. And talking about chemical labyrinthectomy, which is gentamicin, uh, it has a hearing preservation of about 70%. Uh, I tend to use the titration technique with rep repetitive treat treatments in low dosages, uh, uh, monitoring uh, uh, the patient's hearing. Um, you may have tympanic perforations as with any technique of, um, of intratympanic injections. And success rate has been reported as high as 95%. Uh, we should remember that anatomical preservation, either with gentamicin or uh, with a uh, labyrinthectomy localized uh, to the posterior labyrinth, uh, gives chance for cochlear implantation. So it's important to consider that. Talking about BPPV surgical treatment, we know that epilepsy and seven maneuvers uh, have a success rate of 
um, up to 98% uh, after three sessions for posterior canal BPPV and up to 80, 85% after the third session. And most patients may also have spontaneous recovery. But for those that have a very recurrent untreatable BPPV, we may consider singular nephrectomy or posterior superior semicircular canal occlusion. Uh, this article from 2017 um, made a revision about all of the papers, starting with the one from Dr. Richard Gasek in 1978, reporting on singular nephrectomy, and all of those reporting on uh, posterior canal occlusion. As you can see, nobody had the success rate uh, reported by Dr. Gasek in 138 procedures, and apparently only 2.7% of patients with hearing loss. Um, everyone I know who, 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 who tried to do this in the 80s or 90s uh, had patients uh, that went deaf. So uh, this uh, is, 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 is not usually done currently. And notice that most patients with posterior canal occlusion, if it's done properly, preserve hearing perfectly, as you can see here, with a complete uh, success, 100% success rate to control vertigo spells. Other um, things that's treatable by surgery are vascular syndromes uh, treatable by surgical decompression. Uh, this is used for, for instance, for trigeminal neuralgia, hemifacial spasm, and in what we're talking about, eight nerve compression, which may cause pulsatile tinnitus, uh, paroxysmal vertigo, and chronic unsteadiness and hearing loss. Uh, you may identify these patients uh, by symptoms that worsen with activity and uh, improve during rest. Uh, the most um, important ar arteries that um, we have to work with uh, for these pathologies are the posterior, posterior inferior cerebellar artery, the superior cerebellar artery, and the anterior inferior cerebellar artery, as well as, well as the, 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 the basilar. Um, this is uh, important that patients first have to have medical management uh, with antihypertensives or anticonvulsants or benzodiazepines that um, uh, may improve their symptoms. And only those that do not improve uh, may go to surgical microvascular decompression. And here I show you three patients uh, that were operated by different approaches. So you can see different approaches. For instance, a retrosigmoid endoscopic approach, which I did with our neurosurgeon, a ritual labyrinth microscopic approach, with, uh, um, which is a really autologic approach, also a ritual labyrinth uh, approach, but uh, endoscopically assisted, which gave better view of the porous acousticus. So these are autological approaches um, that uh, may be amenable for um, uh, lateral cranial base surgeon. Uh, it's important to consider the uh, middle foss approach for this also. I've never done a microvascular decompression using a, a, a middle foss approach. Uh, I feel more comfortable using the, the retro, retro labyrinth or retro sigmoid approaches but this is feasible also. So uh, that's why I show it to you. Um, here I show you a 54 year old woman uh, with left hemifacial spasm, uh, three episodes in five months. She had left constant pulsatile tinnitus and vestibular paroxysmia. And here you can see the, 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 the artery that's causing all the, program, the problems. You can see it here in this MRI. And this is a surgical procedure um, done for this patient. So uh, I show this one to you guys because uh, this was done with an autological approach, um, lateral skull based approach uh, in which you're watching, I'm, I'm doing a Beals uh, Island. Um, then I'm doing an approach in the same manner uh, with the, the endolymphatic sac surgical procedure. And um, the only difference is 
that you have to work a lot with the posterior semicircular canal to gain as much space as you can. Uh, there, um, I'm cauterizing the, the dura before I open it. And once I open the dura, this becomes a neurosurgical uh, surgery. So most of these procedures I do uh, with a neurosurgeon. Uh, I believe it's important every time you work with um, the cerebellar arteries, for instance, you have to have a neurosurgeon with you because we as autologists are really good preserving the facial nerve, for instance, working the bone, but uh, with the arteries and the um, um, in this region, we have to be really, really, really careful. So here I'm working uh, intradurally now in the posterior semicircular canal only to gain a better access. And then uh, we use the, the endoscope. Uh, so I like this because you don't have to do a, a really large approach. Uh, this will preserve hearing definitely. Um, the only risk is if you open the posterior semicircular canal too much, um, which may render um, hearing loss. But you can see how it's, it's really easy to work uh, using an endoscope at this, at this stage. The evolution after one year is uh, the tinnitus intensity improved uh, 50 to 60% hearing preservation. No one said in or vertigo, no new episodes of hemifacial spasm, no symptoms related to surgical approach. And uh, vascular syndromes treatable by surgical decompression have these uh, results, uh, maybe an 80 to 85% success rate in different pathologies. Uh, another causes of vertigo amenable to surgical treatment uh, are perilymphatic fistula and horizontal semicircular canal dehiscences. Uh, these may be related to cholesteatoma surgery, for instance. We have to do transmastoid surgical repair. And in the case of perilymphatic fistulas, we have to repair and mainly the oval and round windows. And now I'll talk briefly about the future. Uh, to talk about the future, I want to tell you about bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Uh, this was recently um, defined uh, by the Baroning Society. And um, we know that this may happen by different reasons, such as the ones that I show you here, infectious causes, spinocerebellar ataxia, genetic factors, gentamicin uh, mainly, uh, some neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases, uh, Kagan syndrome, for instance. And what's being worked with for this? Um, this group, led by Charles de la Santina, um, have worked with the vestibular implant uh, a long, for a long time now. Uh, these articles that I show you here are um, the, the first that, they, that, that the group published. But uh, what I want to show you is this. Um, this device, which has gone through a lot of, of, of improvement, uh, really may improve the quality of life of about 1.8 million adults worldwide with bilateral vestibular hypofunction. Notice this patient 10 months uh, after activation. Now he's running on a treadmill after four months of continuous uh, MBI stimulation, jumping on a rope better than I would. So uh, this is something that's really, really, really interesting. These are videos from Johns Hopkins Medicine, which you can uh, look at. And the other group that has been working hard on this, uh, this is an article from, from, from 2012, eight years of experience back then. Um, this is, one more recent article talking about how um, you can measure cervical myogenic potentials and uh, control postural response responses with vestibular implants in these patients. Uh, and probably the most recent one of them is this article from 2020, the vestibular implant opinion statement on implantation criteria for research. These guys, which I'm showing you here are uh, Dr. Niels Ginand, um, uh, Raymond Vandenberg, this is Dr. Raymond Vandenberg, uh, 
uh, also Dr. Herman Kigma, Angelica Perez Fornos. Um, these are incredible, incredible, incredible physicians, not only uh, as surgeons, incredibly gifted physicians who I believe are gonna change everything in the, in the years to come. They have more than 50, 15 years uh, working with this. And um, there's also this article, uh, which was from Dr. Manuel Manrique, uh, Dr. Angel Ramos from Spain, Dr. Blake Papsen, um, which was in, uh, published in 2020, talking about vestibular stimulation by cochlear implant, uh, how the cochlear implant itself may uh, elicit a nerve excitation by energy diffusion to the uh, vestibular nerve. Um, also how there's simulation by vestibular implants and how there's a lot of, of people also working in galvanic simulation by superficial electrodes. Here in the National Institute of Rehabilitation, we have someone working on that with good results, uh, improving rehabilitation and making rehabilitation faster. So my final comments are vestibular surgery is still current and evolving and dull lymphatic sac surgery is a good alternative for patients with Meniere's disease and useful hearing. Gentamizing uh, intratympanic injections have a better safety profile for dangerous complications, not for hearing preservation, uh, than in the lymphatic sac surgery, for instance. Vestibular neurectomy, labyrinthectomy, and the combination of both have high rates of vertigo controlling in treatable cases. Uh, the best surgical technique and surgical approach for superior semicircular canal dehiscence syndrome is still debated, and recurrent and incapacitating VPPV is manageable with surgery. So uh, I thank you all for hearing this pre uh, presentation. I hope my English was not that bad. <laughs> uh, and uh, I thank um, Dr. Wagner for, for, for inviting me with you guys to, to, to have this talk. Juan, listen, um, as always, it, it's a, always a pleasure to listen to uh, what you have to say. Um, let, I have a question, and that is, when you're using genomycin, um, what is, tell us a little about the titrations that you use, okay? So, uh, genomycin here in Mexico uh, comes in a dosage of um, 80 milligrams in two milliliters. So, the first thing I do is take only one milliliter out. So I have 40 in one, okay? And uh, after that, I um, mix it with one milliliter of uh, saline. So uh, I get a concentration of 20 milligrams of gentamizing. Uh, that's what I use. And uh, I have to consider that I get a 20 milligram in two milliliter uh, preparation. Mm -hmm. Only about 0.7 milliliters is what I will manage to put inside the milliliter of, of the patient. So uh, I maybe get about 10 milligrams of gentamicin inside. Um, I first start with this and um, I do um, um, B heat uh, tests with the patient's basal then uh, I do the first injections and every Monday or so, I repeat uh, the, the head impulse test to see if I'm lowering the, 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 the function. Uh, I only examine lateral semicircular canals because uh, we've noticed that this is enough. Uh, if I see that nothing is going on, then I increase the concentration um, but I try not to, to, to increase it too much because sometimes gentamicin gives a worse vertigo to the patient than any of the verticals he's had with uh, many years before. And uh, by doing so, I um, usually preserve hearing. Um, I also tend to do um, at least uh, um, twice a month um, audiometry for the patient to, to, to see if hearing is, is, is being preserved. Um, earlier on, we used a gentamicin in the preparation that was amenable for us, uh, eight milligrams in two milliliters, and that's what we used. Uh, the patient usually had a terrible vertigo spell, and um, 
hearing was usually lost. So we stopped doing that. And so your endpoint then is basically the patient becomes asymptomatic. Yeah. Uh, even if, 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 if my head impulse test shows a, some function in the, in the so, some vestibular function, I don't go for a vestibular ablation or, or complete destruction. Uh, I stop when the patient tells me that he's no longer feeling vertigo. Not feeling vertigo, okay. Okay, all right, Juan, uh, let's see here. There's some messages in here, okay. Um, what is, okay, it says, please tell us the dosage for intratympanic steroids, dextra versus methylprednisone. Okay, uh, so here in Mexico, I don't have a methylprednisolone. Um, so we only use dexamethasone. And um, what we use is uh, eight milligrams in two milliliters. That's the, the, the dosage I, uh, we have here. So uh, usually I uh, do five injections, one daily for five uh, days um, consequently. And uh, usually that's enough for, for the patients. And the preparation we have is uh, eight milligrams of dexamethasone in two milliliters. So that's what, what I use. Okay. Um, the next one is, could you compare transtympanic genomycin versus dexamethasone injections in vertigo control? Well, uh, yeah, definitely. So usually most of our patients uh, go through intratympanic uh, um, dexamethasone before any other treatment. And usually maybe eight out of 10 patients uh, have a successful treatment, uh, a success rate of, of about 80% uh, with dexamethasone, at least for a couple of years. Uh, most of these patients improve in a manner that they tell you like, well, I had vertigo spells daily or maybe twice a week. And uh, after the injections, I have, I've had about two, which were short, uh, not that troublesome in, in the last six months. So really, patients really improve a lot with intratympanic uh, steroid injection, even though uh, there's not really, um, uh, for instance, uh, meta-analysis or a, 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 a Cochrane re review or something like that, really supporting uh, intratympanic steroid in injection. But the ones who, 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 who do it, we really know it works. So it's rare that I uh, take a patient to gentamicin. And something that also I have to tell you, uh, I usually don't offer the patient gentamicin injections before I offer him an endolymphatic sac decompression. Because I do believe that endolymphatic sac decompression, even though it's a larger surgical procedure than in-office gentamicin injections, it preserves hearing better. So every time I have a patient that has useful hearing, I tend to use dexamethasone or um, sac decompression and not gentamizing. And uh, probably 90 to 95% of my patients are um, well with that. Uh, and probably about 5% of my patients go to gentamizing. What I usually don't do, uh, now at least, is labyrinthectomy, vestibular neurectomy. I only have one patient who I did vestibular neurectomy. He had no hearing and he had um, two marking crisis. Uh, so he, he abruptly fell uh, every time. And, and, and that was a patient in which I offered uh, vestibular neurectomy with good results. But it's something that I really don't do that often. Okay, one, and then uh, let's see, we have a question here. How many, in how many cases has genomycin injection not been effective? None. I can tell you none. Uh, sometimes it's too effective. That's, that's, my, that's my fear. Because mm -hmm. um, gentamicin uh, administration 
its uh, um, its effect is dependent on on each patient, on its genetic background. Uh, autotoxicity by gentamicin is is determined by 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 by, by your genetics. Uh, so some patients even have enough with one dose. I don't even do any, anything more. Uh, some patients go to vestibular ablation with one dose after the first dose, and uh, some patients require more. In those that require more, uh, using a larger concentration of, of gentamicin usually does it. Um, every time we use, use gentamicin, we also have to tell the patient that they will have to have um, vestibular rehabilitation because sometimes as I tell you it's um, too effective and, and patients will have decompensation and we will have to help them with that um, months after uh, gentamicin. Very good. Uh, anybody have any further questions? I think we're good. Well, that being said, Juan, listen, again, thank you very much for spending your time with us today and, and sharing such an interesting lecture. I like how you kind of balance the history um, and the cases and the treatments all together. It's, it's very effective. Um, well, listen, thank you, Juan. I'll be in touch with you and uh, um, our participants today. Uh, if you have any further questions, please feel free to put them on the uh, um, chat and WhatsApp and we'll connect with Juan, okay? All right, Juan, listen, thank you. Have a good time in Mexico City today. All thank right. Thank you very much. Okay, bye now. Bye.